Hi all, this is Vasu Sham and welcome to Theoretically Podcasting. Apologies for being late with this episode. I was busy finishing up a paper that will be the topic of today's discussion, uh, co-written with my collaborator and uh, hat-trick guest, Yeet Yargich. So congrats, Yeet, on your third appearance on this podcast and welcome. Thank you. This is my... <laughs> I did not the hat-trick eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but... It's not just because I have very few friends, which is true, but also <laughs> because out of our discussions, which literally began as an in-person discussion uh, at Stanford when you visited last winter, um, came this idea, or, or you introduced me to this idea of uh, taking certain quantum field theories and sort of putting them into very large matrices, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And... I joined on as a collaborator uh, on your projects surrounding this with uh, some other brilliant people at Microsoft. And what then happened was a sort of role reversal. So we wrote a paper together and then we even had a podcast about, about that paper mm -hmm. and related work. And then I just started to stare at expressions that looked very familiar and recognized um, some of the building blocks of um, the stuff I mostly work on, which is the TT bar deformation. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit convoluted as, we, as to how we came about this, because we started by thinking about self-dual gravity and the so-called Moyal deformation of self-dual gravity. Very naturally, that Moyal deformation of self-dual gravity was... Um, when we will see is uh, sort of matrix rewriting of self -dual, of the self dual gravity action. And then somewhere in one of the references we were reading, there was a mention that this Moyal deformation was integrability preserving. And that got me very interested because I remembered that the TT bar deformation is well, it started life as the first of a tower of integrability preserving deformations of two-dimensional field theories. And the four-dimensional nature of the um, self dual gravity action is also a little bit fake. It's secretly just two-dimensional. It's non-covariant. Um, so I realized that, well, this must be a very similar effect. And what I was excited to do was generalize TT bar yet again as it has been multiple times. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that it was not necessary. In fact, it was just the TT bar deformation that was happening. And I said, hang on, that's that's very fascinating. So more generally, can we understand this move of matrixization, for lack of a better term, in terms of the TT bar deformation? And it turns out we can. So it turns out Yeet all along was doing what I was trying to do all along. So um, that was very serendipitous. Right, and... I mean, for, for a month we have been looking at these uh, KFTs embedded into matrix models with um, a parameter that describes the, I mean, the non-locality of the interactions in those models. And only now we can, I mean, we got to the realization, you got to the realization that actually this is TT bar, the, the I mean, the yeah. base vectors have the same form, so we can, I mean, Describe the TT bar deformed theories in the matrix language and uh, apply, I mean, all the interpretation that we were able to give to these parameter space in from the matrix perspective, describe then the geometry of the TT bar deformed theories. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and, and what's very striking about this is that we just need to look at the simplest possible manifestation of this connection between um, matrices and geometry, which uh, you will recap uh, shortly, to start to see this. It's it's actually, in some sense, an almost too simple realization to even write a paper about, but we did anyway. Uh, and the link for the paper will be um, in the description below, but uh, you can take it away. We will also be using it as our uh, material uh, today. To, to mull over, so. fresh out of the oven came literally yeah. <laughs> on the archive today if someone's read it already then uh well i i owe you a drink so <laughs> reach out to me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no go ahead uh you then let's let's start by let's start by meditating on the matrices mm -hmm. 
So Here this we are. is the paper um, that um, we wrote and is out on archive today. And um, so here we are relating the uh, matrix theories, which have a certain parameter in them, as I will uh, now talk about, uh, to the TT bar deformed theory, where this parameter is going to be the deformation parameter. And we'll come to the TT bar deformation, but I want to first start by talking about this matrix geometry. So matrices, so two index objects, and um, so the some entries, the matrix entries, which we will think of as degrees of freedom, uh, are embedded in that matrix. And what's important about putting them into a matrix in some way is the, is the matrix algebra, the product of the matrices. And we want to parameterize the entries inside the matrix, the degrees of freedom, in such a way that we can recognize the uh, product between two matrices as um, at a geometric operation that, that we will yes. come Now, um, to do this parameterization of arbitrary matrices, so here we are thinking of matrices two index, but both of those indices are real numbers. So these are uh, matrices with, a continu with two continuous indices. So it's, it's basically a situation where we have very large matrices and uh, we're looking at um, we're looking at a class of matrices whose entries just vary slowly enough between uh, across the matrix that you can almost treat the index as a continuous object. So in, in some sense, you, one has to think about this as the way in which one sees a continuous spectrum from a very dense discrete spectrum. So right. that, that's, yeah, that's what we're going to qualify right. at the outset, but yeah, please continue. So um, let's consider two matrices, um, Q and Q tilde, uh, that we will use to parameterize the entries of an arbitrary matrix. Um, and uh, these Q, Q, Q and Q tilde matrices we introduce such that they satisfy some uh, Heisenberg uh, computer uh, commutator relation with a parameter kappa that we introduce here, uh, a constant parameter. Um, and uh, we can think of, I mean, we think of Q and Q tilde having the um, dimensions of uh, momentum so that kappa has uh, dimensions of length square uh, with h bar being to one. Um, so now we will use Q and Q tilde commutator to parameterize the entries of matrix. And Q and Q tilde don't commute, so the spaces of their eigenvalues wouldn't commute. But we are particularly interested in a commutative representation. Why? Because we want to see these, um, I mean, the fields as functions um, of some parameters. Um, and to be able to write it as a function. So if we are writing it as a function, it means we can arbitrarily localize in the arguments that a function or a field depends on. Um, and so we, and we can only do this in a commutative space. So we will um, do a commutative parameter, space parameterization to have a um, stronger geometric interpretation Right, uh, and this this distinguishes uh, what we are thinking of as matrix, uh, as uh, our preferred matrix models in comparison with the ones that naturally appear in non-commutative uh, mm -hmm. field theory. Yes, because there the idea would be to think about functions valued in those uh, non-commuting variables and thinking of fields as such functions and so on. Whereas here, what we're trying to do is really take. Uh, a notion of a field theory living on a commutative space and give it a certain format of non-locality that borrows from the non-commutativity of the matrices but isn't inherently tied to them. So mm -hmm. coordinates, if we wanted to interpret them in these models, will be regular, quote-unquote, coordinates, commutative coordinates. Um, so yes. This, yeah. So you mentioned non-commutative uh, field theory. One would get a non-commutative space if we were looking at... Um, spaces eigen of eigenvalues from Q left multiplication and Q tilde left multiplication, because those two operations don't commute with each other. Indeed. What we'll instead do is to look at the Q commutator and Q tilde commutator. So Q right. commutator is the map that 
act on a matrix A by giving the output Q commutator A. And these two maps, Q commutator and Q tilde commutator, commute with each other due to the Jacobi identity. Because right. we the commutator with Q and Q tilde commutator, which is a proper which is a multiple of the identity matrix, and that is zero. So the eigenvalues of the Q commutator and Q tilde commutator spend a two-dimensional commutative space on which we can parameterize the matrix entries. Indeed. Indeed. Um, similarly, the Q anti-commutator and Q tilde anti-commutator also commute with each other. If we write out uh, the difference between those two, uh, it again gives the same thing. So these, this from Q commutator and Q tilde the anti-commutator, we also get a, another commutative space. So let's give these some names. So the from the commutator, um, the two parameters, the eigenvalues, the spaces of the eigenvalue parameters we got from the commutator, we will call them P and P tilde. And those from the anti-commutator, we will call them X tilde and X up to some uh, scaling by kappa to get the dimensional theorem. And as we mentioned, the Q and Q tilde commutators commute with each other. It means that P and P tilde commute with each other. They are defined as the eigenvalues of those operations. Similarly, Q and Q tilde are anti-commutators, meaning X and X tilde are commuting coordinates. And we will, I mean, the naming is such that we will um, interpret P and P tilde for reasons um, we are about to come to as a momentum space as momentum space coordinates and x, x, x and x tilde as position space coordinates. Um, what do we mean by that? So firstly, um, we can um, do some, I mean, checks with these, these, I mean, still satisfy the Heisenberg uncommutativity. So x and p, for example, don't commute uh, x tilde and p tilde. And furthermore, I mean, why do they not commute? Um, this is because actually the parameter that the parameter p that we get from q commutator is the Fourier conjugate of the parameter that we get from q tilde anti commutator. We can write this explicitly in terms of matrix indices, entry by entry. Uh, the q and q tilde are re related to each other by a unitary matrix, which I mean, it, its entries are given as this, and if we write it out, um, we see the relationship between them. Now, how is how does that work? So to be specific, let's look write these matrices in the basis in the eigenbasis of Q, so that the matrix Q is going to be a diagonal matrix, um, where in the eighth diagonal, it's, it has the value A, because I mean, it's continuous index, and it's uh, diagonal. That's why we have the delta function between the row and column indices. Now, left and right commutator, left gives A, the row index, right gives the column index B. So P is the index difference, the A minus B, row minus column, um, in that eigenbasis of Q. And similarly, Q here we have A plus B, so X tilde, uh, is kappa times a plus b. If we were to write this in the eigenbasis of q tilde, it would be other way around with tilde and non tilde uh, switch with, with each other. And with that unitary matrix, we can check by the entries that the um, what we have as the x coordinate in the q tilde eigenbasis and c minus d, which is p, the index difference in the Q eigenbases are Fourier conjugate to each other. So um, therefore, the, I mean, these parametrizations of Q and Q tilde are dual to each other by, by the Fourier transformation. Right. So we can summarize this that we just have a matrix, a matrix representation of matrices in some basis. Q and Q tilde were there just to per give a parametrization, mm -hmm. just to do some coordinate fixing. Uh, but essentially, we have the index difference and the Fourier conjugate of index sum that are going to be the P and P tilde, um, the, the two momenta. 
And now we come to the geometric part. That is, um, why is this interesting? That is, um, if we write the matrix product, um, this, is, this was the essential core of what is interesting about writing them as matrices. And now, the, for A and B row column, this is the standard matrix multiplication. We will now rewrite the, these parameters in these index sum index difference. So x tilde is going to be the index sum here. P is going to be the index difference here. P prime is going to be the index difference here. If we rewrite it, what is the x tilde of this matrix? So what is A plus C? It is this. What is C plus D? It is this. This is 2.7 is the same as matrix multiplication written in those parameters. Mm -hmm. So the parameter C that we summed over became P prime. Um, and here the matrices take two arguments, index difference, index sum, which are one position, uh, momentum in one direction, position in the other direction, have this um, operation between them that is equivalent to the matrix multiplication. Now here we see p prime, p minus p prime, so, and here p. So there's a conservation of momentum here. That is why we identified that as momentum instead of some uh, position. That is, for this integral, I mean, integral is a sum in, a, in some infinitesimal sense, and it has all these terms, and for each term, the sum of uh, momenta is the same, and it is the momentum of a matrix entry on the other side. Um, whereas x, x tilde, for example, doesn't satisfy that property. But what does satisfy that property is the Fourier conjugate of x tilde. So if we now uh, Fourier transform this um, formula, uh, 2.8 is the formula that is matrix multiplication in terms written in terms of p index difference and the Fourier conjugate of the index sum that is p tilde. And both of these are um, conserved in the sense that uh, we described. Now, this exponential factor is what the paper is really um, <laughs> about, the, what we will emphasize. Because so here the parameter kappa appears that we wrote as a, I mean, um, wrote in this uh, parameterization. And if let's say kappa was zero, this would be an ordinary convolution. So in the x and x tilde, it would just be pointwise. It isn't pointwise. So here we see that it's not pointwise in x tilde. Uh, but if kappa was zero, it would be pointwise. So kappa here, this exponential factor e to the i kappa um, and this uh, combination is um, describing how the degrees of freedom interact with each other as we multiply two matrices. It's a non-local deformation of pointwise multiplication on the x, x tilde space. Um, and this is, I mean, the, called the Moyad product is equivalent to the um, to the matrix product, but here written in commuting coordinates. Um, and so now we are going to relate this to TT bar deformations. Maybe you can tell us yeah, sure. about the, how this is connected to the TT bar deformation. Yes, yes. So that I'm glad that we went slowly through that entire treatment of the of the matrix geometry because in many ways taking that seriously will run you into TT bar whether or not um, you like it. So to emphasize that fact, let's go straight, not to the section that we wrote first, but to the following section, 3.2, and ask if we modified um, our field theory. So say we, we had a free field theory, but then we put the free field modes into large matrices using exactly the correspondence that we described, where we take P and P tilde to be the energy and momentum components of the free field. You can ask, what is the S matrix given through the LSE reduction formula? Right. So but this is here the 
um, P bolt symbol is uh, a doublet coordinate. Uh, yes, P yes. P tilde. Uh, right. So this is these are fields on two D space. Yes. So one matrix with its two indices gives us at the very least a geometrization of a two dimensional plane with this Moyal product on it. So for the fields that live on this plane, there's a Moyal star product that arises by looking at the space-time dependence of some fields living on this two-dimensional plane through matrix index dependence, right? And now what we're doing is we're asking what happens to free fields. What do we know about free fields? We know that they have uh, only non-trivial uh, time-ordered product being the Feynman propagator. And then all other correlation functions are related to this one through Wick's theorem. Usually we'd say, oh, that just means that 3.21 should give us one as an answer. Why? Because we have all these factors that are basically the formal inverses of GFP. And this entire product, assuming that N is even, so if N is odd, it's zero. Or if N is even, it gives you an even power of GF multiplied with these factors all of which cancel out to give you one, which is the overlap between the two vacua. That doesn't happen here because this logic only applies to when we have a regular polynomial integrated against a Gaussian in the path integral, say. When we have this star product, or we basically have this matrix product between these fields, and momentum conservation here implies that we're essentially going to be taking a trace, what we need to first do is filter out the effect of these stars to then convert this into a regular product between field operators so that we can use our normal uh, logic uh, that cancels Green's functions against the uh, the kinetic operators here. Maybe let's emphasize before we move on why it doesn't hold with the star product because, um, I mean, this is no longer um, ordinary convolution. This is um exactly Moyal, the exponential factor we had in the Moyal product e to the power i kappa times the uh, this combination between p and p tilde that modifies how a degree of freedom at p1 uh bolt p1 and a degree of freedom at bolt p2 these um objects that we have in the correlation function 3.21 it changes that structure so we have these phases in addition to the uh, to just having the field next to each other. Exactly. And all those phases will sum up to the following object, multiplying one. Right? So, so once we're able to filter out the effect of the star convolution, we can use our usual logic and go forward with the calculation as we normally would. But what does that mean? It means, well, free fields scatter non-trivially when we put them into matrices. Right? And how do they scatter? Well, they scatter just through these phase shifts. What's more, we can write this sum of it in the exponent as a product of exponentials of these two body factors, which you have to recognize is a signature of there being some underlying integrability. And in particular, if you take the massless, the ultra relativistic limit, where you boost, say, these two particles in opposite directions when you write them in the helicity representation and then take the mass to zero, the regular way in which one does uh, an ultra relativistic limit, you get exactly the phase shift that one sees that excitations propagating on, say, a free number go to string in Minkowski space would experience. And this is in keeping with TT bar lore that the TT bar deformation is a thing that takes free massless bosons and gives you the number go to action. Right, So we don't know what TT bar means yet because I haven't really explained it. But what we know is that this matrix trick does something very similar. And the point we were making in this paper is that indeed all of this is just TT bar. So let's just go through the steps when we're not really uh, looking at just free fields. Let's just say that we have arbitrary fields and we're using the LSE reduction formula. Then what would normally look like this the time ordered product with these kinetic operators and the on shell conditions turns into the following expression involving the star convolutions. And once again, like we did in the case where we had the free fields, we filter out 
these exponential phases. And what we have remaining is not one, but it's the regular S matrix element to go from um, basically, well, here I've taken them all to be, uh, well, they're not all ingoing. So here there's a difference between um, L incoming and N minus L outgoing particles. So this scattering matrix gets a phase uh, dressing, a momentum dependent phase dressing. And already here, we start to see a known and celebrated result of uh, Dubovsky, Gorbenko, and Mirva Weiss, where they showed that looking at TT bar deformation, the TT bar deformation as a coupling of your undeformed theory to a certain kind of uh, topological gravity theory, one finds the following dressing phase, uh, these dressing phases for all S matrix elements. Again, that's the literature that I mentioned. I haven't showed you what TT bar is yet. Let's <laughs> maybe um, take it a bit slow and recap what we are doing. So we have a theory in the S matrix formulation. Yes. And we are modifying the F matrix element by looking at the correlation functions and replacing these um, point wise um, point products product between the fields. Uh, with a Moyer product that is characteristic exactly. of matrix theories. And this change of all the, the S matrix elements. Um, and that new F matrix element, a new theory defined by um, a value of kappa that goes into this Moyer product, um, it is now we, we are going, um, has these, what I assume you'll explain us, the TT bar deformation literature. Exactly. So, so we're going to recognize these phases, right? So let's just, we'll just take kappa to be infinitesimal for, for the time being, and then ask what def, like what operator does one need to add to our original theory to the interacting Hamiltonian in order to have the effect of just the phase. And it turns out that that is the form factor of this so-called TT bar operator, which is in one way of looking at it, the determinant of T, the stress tensor, or the following quadratic combination, which is just the element-wise description of the determinant. And it's called TT bar for circumstantial reasons. So if you did this in a pure CFT, it would literally be the product of only T and T bar, the, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components of the stress tensor. Away from the conformal fixed point, you're going to have the trace squared involved as well. But for reasons, this operator is always called TT bar and is denoted as such. So this is just standard in the literature. But the basic point is that having the S matrix then be modified by exponentiated versions of these phases means we have done a finite deformation by this operator as in a resummed deformation by this operator TT bar. It's like we've added TT bar, TT bar squared, TT bar cubed, all with various powers of kappa. In other words, if I took the S matrix here, and then I did uh, took a derivative with respect to kappa, I would bring down TT bar, as in the expectation value of TT bar, times this S matrix. So basically this is a flow equation that this phase formula solves. And that manifestation of TT bar was in fact historically the very first to be seen in any context. And this goes back to what we were discussing early on or alluding to about integrability and these integrable theories where there's an almost bootstrap definition of what their S matrices could be. So these are theories that have uh, an infinite number of conserved charges. And the only kind of scattering that respects that is scattering that factorizes into purely elastic two-body scattering, um, two, two scattering. Right, so any S matrix is just a product of two-body S matrices, and those two-body S matrices satisfy something called the Yang-Baxter equations. But all of this doesn't uniquely fix those S matrices. There's a there's a phase ambiguity that one can always multiply the S matrix by, and it'll maintain this integrability property defined by all these different features. And the simplest of such phases are the ones given by the following operator, first being TT bar, and then it has various uh, generalizations or currents constructed with higher powers of the, uh, well, higher conserved charges involved involving polynomials of momenta. But for now, 
That's just a historic reminder of how these phases were first discovered. The generalization that Dubovsky, um, Gorbenko, and Mirbabai made was to discover these phases in any two-dimensional relativistic quantum field theory. When they saw the TT bar deformation as a certain kind of coupling to topological gravity. What we're saying here is that it, it also is just the translation of the underlying geometry of a given undeformed quantum field theory to this matrix geometry that we just described. So that translation changes the um, product operation in the algebra of fields to this star product and the effect of these star products are these phases. And here we were just looking at the S matrix, but we noticed that everything came from just changing this very simple and universal feature, which is the algebra of fields. It's the product algebra of fields. So why limit ourselves? Let's just look at general correlation functions, right? So if you had a general correlation function in some two-dimensional, uh, Euclidean or Lorentzian, um, but relativistic field theory. Uh, what happens if we just take the underlying space-time dependence and replace it with this matrix index dependence as we just described? Meaning we treat the index difference as say momentum, we treat the conjugate of the index sum as energy. Alternatively, um, we keep the index sum as a kind of time coordinate, we keep the index difference as momentum and vice versa. Well, I'm just going to reproduce formula that you wrote above for the matrix product, but now for a string of n matrices, phi a1 to phi a n. And I'm literally taking the representation where I have index difference and index sum. And this is what happens. Starting with the first index difference, all the other index differences are basically constrained to satisfy a conservation relation, uh, which is basically momentum conservation given as follows. And the index sum gets modified with kappa, right? With the strength kappa involving the index difference, right? So, so the index difference goes into the index sum. Uh, so this is a sense in which index sum is not a conserved quantity. Its conjugate is, but by itself, it's not a conserved quantity. And with uh, staring, one can realize that this is just a generalization of the formula you wrote above for how to look at the matrix product and convert it into a, pro a, a convolved product, a star product, let's call it that. And we can summarize this in the following expression. Product of N fields now seen as living on this matrix geometry is just given by product of the regular product of those fields, but with arguments shifted in a very particular way. The momenta all satisfy their usual conservation relation, but we have the time index getting shifted in a way that's proportional to the difference in the total integrated momentum surrounding that particular operator, right? So this is what the j bigger than, j lesser than symbol is supposed to indicate. It's the total momentum on either side of the string. So here, we only have one momentum behind. We have all the rest to the right. So we have a sum of everything to the right of two minus p1, which is to the left of two, and so on. And from the, the symmetric property of this star product in the Fourier conjugates, the same is true when we take the conjugate of the index difference and, um, well, the conjugate of the index sum. And what happens there is that the positions get shifted, the spatial positions get shifted by an amount proportional to the integrated energy surrounding this operator and with just the energy satisfying conservation as they normally do. And this is nothing but a partial position space rewriting of the uh, phases from the previous section. When we do S matrix, what we were doing was momentum space S matrix, and we were using the LSE reduction formula uh, to take correlation functions in momentum space 
and then write them in terms of S matrix elements, right? So that's all that's all just a Fourier transform of what's going on here, which is a sort of like position space representation, but a partial position space representation. And Cardi was uh, had had realized this exact fact about the TT bar deformation. And in a brilliant paper about how to deform correlation functions uh, by TT bar, showed that the following very general formula holds. That if you took the kappa derivative, then any correlation function will be dressed in the following fashion. But what is this fancy operator? So if you thought about it as an operator, it's like attaching a string, a kind of string-like defect to the position of every individual operator and measuring the amount of integrated stress energy flowing across that string. Sounds very crazy, but it's just a formalization of the formula that we had before, right? So, so all we do is we take these formulae, differentiate by kappa, recognize that E greater E less than is basically the following expression in terms of the integrated energy, integrated energy density, and J greater than minus J less than is the following expression in terms of the integrated momentum density. And writing that covariantly just gives us the following expression, Cardi's expression. So this, when it first came out, at least to me, it was a very striking and interesting result. It remains a very striking and interesting result. But I, for one, did not really know what exactly to do with it. Whereas this matrix picture just makes it evident that all you're doing is saying that you replace the underlying geometry with this matrix geometry. And, and that's it. You just modify the product, right? From the regular product to the star product. And that's it. This is exactly what this formula is describing. So that is in essence how TT bar gives um, a different name to this kind of matrix geometry generalization of local quantum field theories in two dimensions. And the two-dimensional nature came from there being two matrix indices, literally, right? So it's like TT bar deformation being itself two-dimensional is kind of one of the simplest means by which one gets a covariant delocalized or you know slightly non-local deformed quantum field theory starting from a local relativistic quantum field theory. So is this matrix generalization. And it turns out they're exactly the same. And uh, this is quite evident. One more thing to do is in the case where we have a um, an integrable quantum field theory, we can use the beta equations to basically look at how the total energy gets deformed. And this total energy deformation is exactly in line with what uh, Smirnov, Zamologikov, and Kavalia and collaborators discovered in their seminal uh, original papers about TT bar in 2016, where they showed that the deformed energy satisfies a flow equation that has the form of an inviscid Ber Berger's equation with or without source, depending on whether there's total momentum flowing or not. So in summary, all of these are just different facets of the realization that there's a non-trivial operator product deformation when we move from regular space-time dependent functions to matrices, right? So here, what we're saying is not that we are looking at matrix-valued fields. We're saying that essentially the space-time dependence of fields becomes matrix index dependence. So it's in many ways almost like saying that we're shifting from a local field theory to something like a matrix integral. So th that point has to be emphasized here because it's easy to get these two things confused. But the essence of this idea is that it's a literal translation to a matrix integrals worth of degrees of freedom. Right. So there's some ensemble of matrices out of which we're just picking these fields. And then we're just looking at expectation values of their products, their matrix products. And the locality, all of it just emerges from the structure of the matrix product itself. And that's what Yeet was basically explaining there. And so that that's that's sort of the essence and the novelty of the idea. And turns out that that apparently is what TT bar does. It, it doesn't just take scattering amplitudes and put them into large matrices. 
he takes quantum field theories in general and puts them into large matrices. So uh, that that is sort of um, the moral of the story, right? So so having seen all of this, we can now go to our original motivation. So our original motivation was self-dual gravity of all things, mm-hmm. right? So this is a very unlikely um, trigger, at least if you told me, I would have thought that it was an unlikely trigger to understand, uh, to, you know, as an invitation to understand TT bar, but well, let's take a step back and just look at the Heisenberg algebra. So, so let's let's say that okay, we've we've made this brilliant connection. Now let's leverage this connection, and first let's just look at some very general features of uh, what happens when we take this Q and Q tilde seriously and exponentiate them. Right. So here, what we're looking at is a matrix version of the finite translation operator. Subtlety is that unlike the regular finite translation operator, uh, these two matrices don't commute. Right, Maybe whereas... let's talk a bit about why we are doing this. Because we, sure, have, yeah, a yeah. we have a two-dimensional space that is just a... Um, combination and reparametrization of the matrix indices. The right. Well, and column we transform in such a way we have this two-dimensional space. That space is itself is commutative, but interactions on it aren't, and um, which will follow this Moyer structure. So Moyer structure is a is usually I mean first discussed in the the quantum mechanics as a deformation of the uh, Poisson bracket. Um, And so this this is related to the Poisson structure. That is uh, the deformations of the space that is what we want to look at that um, preserve this Poisson structure. And those deformations, we will either put them into a Poisson algebra or a Moyal algebra to get the algebra of the deformations. So the plane wave is going to be a basis, is a basis of the deformations um, of the two-dimensional plane. And whether we are looking at this in the um, the with the Moyal bracket or the Poisson bracket tells us about the uh, deformed right. or undeformed um, uh, diffeomorphism algebra. The, that preserve the Poisson structure. And right, that is, right. yeah, so the, because we define these parameters in terms of Q and Q tilde and they satisfy the Heisenberg algebra, that is what we want to do uh, the, to relate to really relate the algebra of deform, the diffeomorphisms to its bottom, the Heisenberg algebra. And you were now to, uh, seeing the plane wave, um, the, we expand these um, yeah. around the powers of Q and Q tilde, maybe you can. Right, right. So, so for yeah. reasons um, I guess we'll get to, uh, we can expand the plane wave itself in powers of Q and Q tilde in much the same way as um, authors in these, well, uh, yeah, well, authors in these papers showed that one can expand regular plane waves in powers of the um, sort of k and k bar, so uh, linear combinations of the time and space conjugate momenta. And what happens is that for every power a and b of q and q tilde, we have one frac e. So we have frac e a b. And if we thought about what it actually is, well, it's a symmetric polynomial in Q and Q tilde to power B and A, respectively. So that's what this symbol is to de- is meant to denote. So E, these indices only know about the powers, right? Whereas what this is, is a symmetric polynomial. And so you've given some examples here where we have uh, E12. And um, well, as you can see, E12 has a total power three. So it's going to be cubic in... Q or Q, like, you know, the combination of Q and Q tilde. But the symmetric ordering uh, means, or, you know, like what we're doing is we're sort of symmetrizing over every combination. So we have Q, Q tilde squared, Q tilde, Q, Q tilde, and Q tilde, Q squared. 
So these are a few things, and we bring them together in this uh, symmetric uh, combination. And we can show that these satisfy the following um, Moyal algebra. So what does that mean? Well, it's basically commutator under the star product. Right? So, so that's what we mean by uh, curly brackets power Moyal to be distinguished with curly brackets appearing much before that just denoted anti-commutator. So this is an anti-commutator. This is really commutator under star operation. And when we take the commutator under star operation, we get the following uh, amazing mess, which apparently is the algebra known as the W, big W wedge algebra. Um, and when we take kappa to be uh, small, basically as we take kappa to zero, this algebra reduces to the little w wedge algebra, the algebra of Poisson preserving diffeomorphisms of the plane. And that just satisfies the following much simpler uh, Moyal commutation relation when you take kappa to zero. So it's like wordy way of talking about the star commutator in the kappa to goes to zero limit. And here, these EABs, one could just obtain, well, okay, I mean, this is sort of the same EABs, but if you wanted to just uh, think about where they could come from, well, these just come from doing the same kind of expansion with regular plane waves. So you just took the regular plane waves and expand them in powers of the momentum. What do this, okay, what's being captured here, right? Like what's what could respect this algebra? Well, the things that could respect this algebra are things that could respect basically uh, sort of, conjugation by big like by, by these uh, finite uh, translation operations right so so if we had a so we had some kind of theory that respected not just translation invariance as in just invariance under commutator operation with q and q tilde but really something much more nonlinear right where we have sort of charges associated with all of these right and it's it's sort of subtle to even think about exactly what they are as in commutator with respect to all of this Right, so it's, it's like some higher power of momentum and energy being combined in some very particular fashion. Then such a theory would respect this uh, W wedge algebra. And it turns out that there are such theories in the world and that they are known as self-dual gravity and self-dual Yang mills. Our yeah. focus, yeah, sorry, go on. Maybe uh, it is important to mention, we are talking about the Heisenberg operator of the Poisson algebra, but this isn't between position and momentum. These are, right. uh, these are Poisson structures on a two-dimensional uh, space-time. Uh, yeah. the, the, not momentum, but the uh, coordinates that, on which there's a, either exact or approximate sense of locality. Um, and these EAB are uh, monomials, uh, symmetrized monomials of those space-time coordinates, not uh, position and momentum. Right, but, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really um, not common for theories to have, in between their space-time arguments, to have a Poisson structure. I mean, Poisson right. structure, we usually get it in a phase space re formulation between position and momentum. But self dual gravity is one theory where there is a Poisson structure really between two um position the two coordinates uh space-time coordinates and specifically exactly. a light concordant and a complexified um helicity uh chiral coordinate right right so it's not that we're looking at um say some quantization procedure and we're associating these two things as being conjugate to each other so this is this is basically the commutator operation under these are just translations in different directions of this geometry of this two-dimensional geometry and this is basically what Yeet means when he says that there's a Poisson structure appearing within the action right so so we take what's called uh Plebansky's secondly second heavenly equation which is basically um the equation that the right helicity or left helicity only uh graviton satisfies and we write an action for it by just multiplying these equations against a lagrange multiplier phi bar right but this poisson uv curly bracket what it means is basically we take the following poisson bracket in uw space 
on partial u phi and partial w phi. So this is going to have four derivatives once it goes through this um, this entire uh, structure. And you can show that this action actually arises from light cone gauge fixing of regular general relativity when you linearize it. Um, or there's twister manifestations of, uh, of the nonlinear graviton that provide this equation when interpreted in just space time. Yeah, maybe let's say it again. I mean, this action isn't something we developed. It's uh, the Chalmers yes. Hill action. And to get there from Einstein's, uh, the Einstein Hilbert action, we do some gauge, do, do a gauge fixing to have a theory only in terms of the two polarizations of the graviton, rather than having this um, metric, the 10 coordinates with diffeomorphism, all, all those symmetries. We do gauge fixing to the extent that we will have a theory only in terms of these actually propagating two degrees of freedom. And then, um, so what do those degrees of freedom satisfy or what is the action written in terms of them? The cubic term, the, between the cubic interaction term between the plus plus minus helicity modes is what the Chalmers action is. Exactly. So in some sense, one has to think about phi bar as being like, you know, as coming from the the Negative one positive. minus helicity mm -hmm. or the one plus, de depending on which yes. one we're choosing. It's the uh, it's the odd uh, one in in the vertex. And um, one should see that there is a full Laplacian, but the interactions are conspicuously, they're conspicuously confined to this UW plane. Now, this non-covariant structure is just a natural consequence from one perspective of gauge fixing, right? When you when you do this light cone gauge fixing and, you know, you, you break manifest covariance and, yeah, you should expect that. Um, but also, this restriction to two dimensions is fascinating. Well, we'll we will make use of it. Uh, let's put it that way. So when you have this Poisson structure... It's tempting to say, and uh, some other people did do this, but it is tempting to say, what if we saw this Poisson structure as coming from some limit of a Moyal structure, right? So, so where there was a genuine star product, and we took the kappa goes to zero limit of this kind of uh, of this kind of system, and that leads to so-called Moyal deformed self-dual gravity, which was recently in the press, um, where in addition to the regular kinetic term, we now have the Moyal star product on the UW plane uh, between partial U phi and partial W phi, right? So, so this is almost straight up the alley of the kinds of theories we're interested in, right? It's, this is basically like as if somebody took phi, like, you know, this, this original theory and then put it through the matrix machine that we just described. So that was the first thing that we kind of noticed, right? Right, and... these two papers um, came in the last week of August, uh, and it it was about these deformations of the Chalmers Siegel action, not about the matrix or the TT bar yes. deformation. Um, and yeah, and their yeah. basic point, just to connect back to the previous section, their basic point was that this action and the, the amplitudes one derives from this action benefit or, or they basically see the following w little w wedge algebra right so they they respect the little w wedge algebra and then you can ask well who respects this oh that's basically going to be well sorry i went too far it's basically going to be the moyal deformed version of it so that was the thrust of those two papers uh, or at least in large part the thrust of it was to study the manifestation of this um of this w algebra and it's sort of like um the cousin, the bigger cousin with the big W, and how they arise uh, in the in the sort of amplitudes um, program, because there they've been making a sort of uh, like in the celestial holography program, they've you know been making the rounds and you know they they just noticed that there's a generalization when one looks at self dual gravity and self dual Yang Mills theory. Our temptation was then to associate this to some kind of matrix action. So could we just write this as a matrix integral? And uh, without much effort, he did. And here is the summary of it. I guess you two could go through this um, because we haven't yet talked about how to write down actions. Mm -hmm. 
when we when we do this but yeah yeah so writing down actions that's something we had in the previous paper which we also have a video about uh, on your channel so uh, yes uh, our listeners should also watch that uh, but uh, i mean the short story is that in the when we um, have these matrices in the uh, multiplying each other or some ex the way we would write a field theory action we write it with matrices but with they are just have the index dependency instead of space-time dependence and these Moyen product Moyen exponential Moyen factors automatically arrive in every interaction term now the Moyen factor is always relating um, along two components row and index uh, to each other by a um, symplectic uh, duality, the symplectic Pairing, conjugation, yeah. the two parameters, there's P and P tilde that are symplectically conjugate to each other. Whereas the Chalmers-Siegel action is a four-dimensional theory, uh, but it all has a Poisson structure only along these uh, U and W directions. The, the Poisson bracket or the Moyen bracket is only between the U and W on a two-dimensional plane. So what happens to the other coordinates if we were to try to write this in terms of matrices? I mean, in a matrix model, each of them require their conjugate direction and the term in the Moyen factor that captures that uh, conjugacy. Now, this is uh, the second last paper we had with the Turpitz models embedding them uh, the um, uh, with the assuming that I mean truncating the matrices or constraining the matrices to have um, to be diagonal or to be triplets we are essentially um, in the in terms of p and p tilde saying that the field values peak only at p equals zero uh, if that's a diagonal matrix or only at p tilde equals zero, if that is a um, triplet matrix. So restricting the p or p tilde will also restrict the symplectic structure to a Lagrangian subspace, therefore removing the corresponding term from the Moyer bracket. So we can now say that in the four-dimensional theory of Chalmers-Siegel action, u and w are going to be symplectically conjugate to each other, v and w prime are not but they each have their own conjugate parameter which are going to be truncated over by um, a form of these triplets constraints right so, yeah to each index now we have composite indices that both the row indices and the column indices are going to be a triplet um, so that this is a, going to be a six-dimensional theory in each uh, pair of the triplet, the two triplets. Um, but we are going to constrain the matrices as in 5.12. That is uh, the first one saying the commutative with Q till the two vanish, which means that in the two direction, these are triplet matrices. And the other one saying Q3, uh, phi that van the commutator vanishes, which means they are diagonal in the third index, third index direction. Um, so that we remove the Moyal factors in both of them, and we will only have the Moyal factor in the one one tilde direction. Now this is a, I mean, a chiral projection. Um, yes. Because if we did have dub, uh, something conjugate to w bar what would happen in the action if we look at the action the action has derivative uh in the original action. sorry the original action yeah yes so this has derivative with respect to w and the bracket also gives more derivative with respect to w but it doesn't have any derivative with respect to w bar if it did it would be mixing with negative helicity right um so these triplets or triplet constraints are a result of the uh, helicity projection. The right, right. Well, no, that's that's a very good point. So, I, just to summarize, the challenge is basically to localize the Moyal structure along only two of the dimensions. And you can ask, what is 
the means by which we recover just an ordinary quantum field theory represented through these matrices. And that's the point of uh, your paper before the previous that you just mentioned, where if we restrict matrices to be toplets, as in to depend only on the index difference or the index sum, well, really on only the index difference, then what happens is that we have a reduction from n squared to n degrees of freedom, and we recover that we just have the convolution operation between all the momentum space uh, field uh, operators. And then the issue becomes to maintain dimensionality. If we just reduce to toplets, then what happens is we just go down by half the number of dimensions. So, so, so we really need to maintain here four dimensions, right? So we want fields to propagate in four dimensions, but we want them to only have a non-commutative structure in two. And how to get that is to have two dimensions worth of uh, essentially regular uh, fields. I, we want the algebra to be like the same as we normally have them, but that means that we need to, to, to go up to six dimensions and remove two through the toplets constraint and then rely on the fact that infinitely large toplets matrices have a commutative algebra and then what we have is an embedding of regular field theory type uh, dynamics into matrix integral form right and we don't constrain these other two directions and then that naturally gives us the Moyal star product so you see the problem here isn't so much the Moyal star product <laughs> it's really more the non-Moyal stuff <laughs> and that's what these toplets constraints are here to ensure for us but it is very interesting that this reduction to six from six down to four dimensions is in effect giving us the projection to just the one, the definite chirality, right? So to have the one chirality as opposed to the other. Um, and uh, that we want to understand better what the meaning is, what possible relation there is to twister space, because, well, you see the magic six here. So yeah, all that to come in, in future papers. But in the end, we get the following matrix integral. So so we have this, this trace, uh, which just gives us the, potential in a matrix integral where now phi and phi bar satisfy the following toplets constraints, All right? So phi and phi bar have zero commutator under Q tilde two and Q three. Right, so I was saying, uh, talking about writing an action with matrices. So this is yes. the action that we exactly. arrived at and I can also explain why this is um, the Moyal deformed Charles Chalmers Siegel action because what Trace does is that it takes, um, I mean, if we just write it in terms of row and column indices and then look at it in these index difference, conjugate of index form, what it does is that it's really the integral over each of x and x tilde, or equivalently, it is take the value of whatever the whole matrix inside is, the Lagrangian which is also a matrix now at p equals zero, p tilde equals zero. Now, um, we will look at, let's talk about it in the moment, in terms of the momenta, because we have a lot of commutators here. So the first two terms in the parentheses are um, quadratic in phi and phi tilde. So they won't have these Moyal factors because Moyal factor at p equals zero, p tilde equals zero, the total that that's going to, um, that, that vanishes, I mean, it becomes one. Uh, so these aren't susceptible to these uh, Moyal effects, but the Q1, Q2, these commutative are taking out the, those eigenvalues of the, from the matrix, the degrees of freedom inside the matrix, the first two terms. Uh, so that from the first two terms, we have uh -huh. Laplace here. Right. So so this basically uh, gives us just... So, so basically, this term in the action, right? So this is... Note that yeah. it's quadratic. Subject to these constraints is essentially equivalent to this Laplacian. term. The Laplacean. Exactly. Yes, yes. Because the Laplacean a bit above was 
Ah, you've def okay, you've given it. Uh, yeah, the Laplacian was du dv minus du dv plus dw dw bar, um, which is in these coordinates we wrote uh, when we look at now the matrix section, is really we identified this as the p1, p2 minus p1 tilde, p2, 3 tilde is the Laplacian in those coordinates. Great, uh, in great. Coordinates. Whereas the third term, the interaction term, has this uh, inside it, the du uh, and dv, dw, yes. u and dw, but it also has a commutator between... Uh, the two the commutators. Matrices. Yes. And this is a cubic term, so it is going to see all the see a Moyen factor and all those um, order, high order kappa effects. Uh, so this is what that term is, because we, we saw that when we write uh, these as matrix products, it takes that factor. So if, it, if this is a matrix commutator, it's going to take, instead of e to the power, it's going to take sine uh, right. of the right. two derivatives. And that's the deformation of the Poisson bracket that we have in the chalmers siegel action. Exactly. So let's let's just jump back to that and then jump forward. So remember that when we wrote the Moyal product, there was a sign of basically these momenta, right? So so the, the, the Moyal bracket came from the starred commutator and the sign just came from taking exponentials and taking the difference. Now, a difference with a different ordering, of course. Now, let's just look at the Three level S matrix elements, we look at the three point vertex, right, in momentum space. In the pure Chalmers Siegel, Chalmers Siegel theory, it's just P1 cross P2 squared, right? So P1 cross P2 in just the same notation as we had before with the epsilons. And now when we take our trace here, then basically the deformation involves exactly the kind of factors that we anticipate from the TT bar deformation. So it's exactly these uh, things that would otherwise become the CDD phases, but because of the commutator structure of the action, you get a you get a sign. And in the other literature, they took I kappa to be Q, and so there was a cinch instead of this. So it's, it's just a difference in convention in uh, what we're calling our deformation parameter. So here, what we see is that there's this peculiar sense in which there's almost a TT bar deformation partially applied to a particular two-dimensional subspace of the overall four-dimensional space in which the original theory lives, which we thought was a very interesting effect. And having identified the matrix, in, the, the matrix uh, integral equivalent of the Moyal deformed self dual gravity theory, it was quite clear that what's actually happening is that in all the places we're not imposing the toplitz constraint, we actually have the effect of the TT bar deformation. So this is um, this was the original trigger for us to go down this rabbit hole. So um, that is basically the essence of our paper. And um, as I said, we will definitely leave the description link in the description. And uh, hopefully for all the people that I will email, this is an adequate, if not overly long explanation, but you should feel free to respond to said email asking any follow-up questions that you may have. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I guess we can talk a little bit about some of the directions to go from here, um, but I mean, uh, it, it, there's almost too many to name. Um, personally, given my involvement in the TT bar holography world, my main interest is to try and generalize from the TT bar to the so-called TT bar plus lambda two deformation, uh, where we turn on, in addition to the TT bar operator, a cosmological constant that in effect just has value related to the TT bar coupling. Right, so it's kind of funny deformation, which basically tells you how to go from a holographic description of ADS3 to a holographic description of finite regions within DS3, which is in many ways a one lower dimensional problem 
of describing holography within our static patch in the observable universe. So having that be a matrix integral, I think would be unsurprising to some of the wise uh, amongst our colleagues, but very satisfying for the rest of us. So I think that that, that would be a, a direction to pursue with, with very big payoff. But of course, there's a zoo of seemingly non-commutative models with these funny Poisson-like structures, which apparently have something to do with the TT bar. In particular, the Chamblish Siegel action itself, right? If you just looked at the um, operator there that appears, this P1 cross P2 whole squared, it's, it's kind of computing uh, TT bar if you <laughs> measured momenta correctly. <laughs> so... Well, why is that? How did that? How how does that happen? I mean, is it itself TT bar deformation of something like that? That's been my question, um, and uh, yeah. So there's just all sorts of other places to go. I mean, how does JT bar or TJ bar get realized in these in these settings? So yeah, I mean, <laughs> no shortage of things to pursue given this connection. But it is funny that we landed on it um, without even sort of sleepwalked into this, uh, this connection. <laughs> that's that's been my impression. <laughs> it's been in front of us for a long time that that we only now <laughs> see the TV bar perspective. Yeah, I mean, looking at the more effective and the matrix in the matrix model for uh, yeah quite some time now. That's true. That's true. And we've been trying to understand what its effects possibly are. We were struggling so hard before to say, well, is there like what's the simplest example of a theory where we introduce this Myel factor, or in other words, we turn it into this matrix integral and then we interpret in momentum space the amplitudes, like, well, what is that effect? And we were kind of going back and forth. And, you know, there were some ideas that were more, some ideas that were less promising. Turns out it's all the TT bar just had the answer. It had the answer right in front of us. And um, yeah, it's it, it, it in some sense makes sense that this very universal thing is related to this other very universal move of relating uh, field operators to matrices. So I, I think it's very exciting. Definitely. There's, there's, it connects to so many things that... Um, that... It's exciting to <laughs> start going through. Yeah. Those. Well, I mean, it also means that you're now a, um, I don't know, you're a committed uh, repeat guest on this podcast <laughs> because it's, it's inevitable that we'll be doing uh, yet another of these relatively soon with uh, yet another paper. Um, and hopefully we can rope in some more of our uh, collaborators <laughs> into some of these projects <laughs> I'm, I'm always happy to be your guest here <laughs> oh thank you Ian. i'm always happy to have you uh but anyway um there's way too much left to be said so it's a good point to wrap up now um again if you have any questions email us our email addresses are in the paper um if you like this video like subscribe leave a comment this is Theoretically Podcasting, and I will see you soon with yet another episode.